you, church family. My name is Susie, and we're excited that you're here to worship with us. Before we move forward in our service, here are some announcements you should know about. In 2023, we've committed to reaching our world through seven mission projects from right here in our community to around the world. You can impact the world for Jesus by serving on a team to reach places like Miami, Puerto Rico, or Southeast Asia. Learn more about these trips and register at fbtc.org slash missions. Spin the spinner, beat the clock, skip ahead, level up, and play to win. Vacation Bible School Twist and Turns is a fantastical celebration of games of all kinds, and volunteer registration is now open. VBS this year will be June 26th through 30th, so it's time to make sure you are registered to serve. Head to fbtc.org slash VBS to register today. We're looking toward the summer with our kids' camps registration. Your child will have a blast this June learning about Jesus while traveling to Camp Baldwin or Centra Kid. First and second grade camp is June 5th and 6th, and our third through sixth grade camp will be June 19th through the 23rd. Learn more and register at fbtc.org slash kids. During our discipleship hour tonight, adults will have a showcase to introduce the new classes for the last half of the spring. Come out to the adult department at 5 p.m. to find a class that speaks to you. Of course, preschoolers, kids, and students all have their worship ministries at 5 p.m. too, so bring the whole family. Hey, first time visitors and new guests, we'd love to get to know you better and hear about any prayer requests you have through the Connect card found in your worship guide. And if this is your very first visit to FBTC, we also have a small gift for you waiting at the Connect area in our lobby after the service. So make sure to stop by, meet our pastor, and receive that free gift. Now enjoy the rest of the service.
to lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. It's a great to be in God's house today. And man, last Sunday was just an incredible day of worship, wasn't it? And those of you who maybe weren't here, but man, God just fell upon us and toward the invitation. And we, uh, I was late for lunch and uh, didn't make it in time to the lunch place. And anybody else have that problem? That's a good problem to have, though, isn't it? Amen? And uh, it's just great to be together. You know, as we walk in here today, we walk in here, I know, with concerns and just thoughts on our heart. And uh, my prayer today is that God would just speak to our hearts today. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 11 says this, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Jesus? Egypt, And he said, certainly I will be with you, and this shall be the sign that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. And verse 13 says this, Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I shall say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name, and what shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And you know, today as we worship and as we lift up the name of Jesus, I know there are concerns on our hearts and struggles and issues and trials that we're all going through. And, uh, but you know, I want to remind us all today that that is the same God that we serve today. Amen. I am the God who still listens. I am the God who still answers. I am the God who still heals. I am the God who still forgives. I am the God who still leads. And I am the God who still directs. And I am the God who still cares. And I am the God that still loves. That is the God that we serve today. Amen. Give him praise today, church. Just thank you for who he is. Sing this with us this morning. I want to be close, close to your side.
the mountains shake before him. Come on, let's lift the roof off the place today. You ready, church? Here we go. this morning right where you're at and just I want you to just listen as the praise team and the choirs we sing this first line today broken and lost you found me just listen to this let it minister to your heart today just listen to these words
know that we are his, amen. We are a child of God. And today, uh, Pastor Derek is out today, and uh, he is in Israel leading a group over there. But uh, Brother Mark's going to come in just a few moments, and uh, he has been tasked with preaching on the second half of the creed. I don't know about you, but uh, God has really spoken to my heart through this this time together, the last two weeks that we've kind of broken this down. We've been singing this song quite a bit. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus, our Savior. And just reminding us of what we believe. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing this together.
pray together. Father, we come to you today. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your spirit, Lord, that we sense here today. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Pray with Brother Mark now as he comes and shares today, Lord, from God's word. Lord, that you would just illuminate in his heart, Lord, what you want him to say. Give him the words, Lord. Give him a boldness as he shares today, Lord. And Lord, we would be remiss today if we just didn't say it again, Lord. We are so thankful to be able to worship, Lord, and to lift up your name. Lord, I know it's hard and difficult for us to even fathom, but I know there are places that they can't mention your name. That name, Lord, that is above every other name that we've sung about today. Lord, and we're thankful, Lord, for your son, Jesus. Lord, speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, we're thankful for what you're doing and what you're going to continue to do in our hearts today. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Be seated. Thank you for joining us and standing and worshiping uh, the Lord this morning, uh, whether you're here in our congregation with us or whether you're watching online through our stream. Uh, we're glad to have you with us today. And um, in saying that, it's good to be here. It's good to have the opportunity uh, to preach to you today. So, I need your bag. So. Okay. Good? Okay. There we go. There we go. Okay. Good. All right, as I was saying, thank you for worshiping with us this morning, standing and singing and raising your hands to him. And also for those that are joining us online, it's good to have you here this morning as well. Well, some of you uh, may have wondered, where has Brother Mark been? Uh, I've had people ask me that, and they've said, well, I don't see you down front anymore. Uh, I am still employed here, uh, (laughs) working at the church, as always, as hard as ever. Um, different Sundays, I'm different places. When I am here, I'm in the overflow. Uh, that's kind of been my assignment over there to be the pastor for the overflow if anyone needs anything or has a decision to make at the end of the service. And then also the uh, one Sunday a month, I'm at St. Elmo uh, preaching in our rotation there. I was there last week, got the opportunity to preach uh, the first part of this. So uh, I'll be able to actually have both parts Uh, sharing with you. And then also on the third Sunday of every month, uh, I lead the new members class uh, that we have during this worship hour time. So uh, that's kind of where I've been. I've been around, uh, just hadn't been in here. But it is good to be with you today and good to be with you to share on our second uh, part two of the We Are Family series, Family Beliefs. And we've been looking at the Apostles' Creed as that core belief that we have based on scripture of how we should live and believe as Christians. Let me strive every moment of my life to make myself better and better to the best of my ability that all may profit by it. Let me think of the right and lend all my assistance to those who need it with no regard for anything but justice. Let me take what comes with a smile without loss of courage. Let me be considerate of my country and of my fellow citizens and my associates and everything I say and do. Let me do right to all and wrong to no man. Now that was a creed that was of a superhero that maybe you have not heard of. Some some of you older folks may have. It's one that I didn't know. Actually, possibly came before even Batman and Superman in the comics. His name was Doc Savage. And that was a creed that he he lived by, an oath that he pledged his life to. Uh, Lester Dent developed him as possibly the first superhero, and he hit the comics in 1933. Wow, that's way back. And basically, Doc Savage was this type of guy. He was trained by his dad uh, to be basically a near-perfect human. Uh, All the scientists and people that worked with his dad trained him to be super fast, to be super strong. 
He also uh, was a master of disguise. He, was, he learned martial arts. He had a photographic memory as well. He had studied animals in the jungle to learn how to be stealthy like they were. Uh, he was even a musician, a violinist, and a ventriloquist. He could even throw his voice places and act like he was somewhere else. And then also, upon all of that, he was a doctor who was a neurosurgeon. Wow, that's one superhero to have that much stuff piled into one person. But he, he was a good read. He was a good escape during the times that were going on in 1933. If you're a student of history, you know that was still during the Great Depression. Matter of fact, it was at its height. It was 25% of the nation in America was unemployed at the time. If you can imagine that. Many people living uh, off of beginnings of welfare and government help and soup kitchens to, to stay alive and stay going. Suicide rate was the highest that year that it had ever been in our nation's history at 1933. Also, crime was very prevalent, given that many people uh, did not have much. Chicago alone had 1,300 gangs in them. It was the days of Bonnie and Clyde who were glamorized. So America needed a, a hero, at least someone they could read about and escape with. And so Doc Savage had this creed, and Lester Dent had invented him for people to read and had that escape about because of their times. Now, today, we have times that are tough too. And we need something to guide us, something that we'll, we can live by, something that we can uh, read and keep in our mind and our heart. And, and one of those things is the Apostles' Creed, as it's based on Scripture. And we've been reading through it, learning it. Jude, uh, if you have your Bibles, if you'll go there to the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 3. Jude has similar times. I mentioned last week to the people at St. Elmo in verse 3, Jude talks about his reason for writing this little letter. And he says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. In other words, he was starting out to write just kind of a nice letter that say I would write you if you had moved away and I was going to catch you up on things with me and, and let you catch up things with you. It's just going to be a nice general letter about the doctrine of salvation we both believed in. And yet, there's a comma there. And it says, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you or encouraging you to contend, which is a word for fighting or struggling, contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. And if you read on about Jude's letter, there's a lot about heresy, and I believe also the time was the time of persecution. So those things were pressing in on Jude. And perhaps Jude had just gotten some news about some heresy. The Gnostic heresy was going around at that time that said that all matter was evil. Our physical bodies are evil. And, and if you were to believe in Jesus, he certainly wasn't a real flesh and blood person that could die on a cross. And so that was being accepted by many people and false teachers had crept into the church and Jude saw it very necessary to wake the people up, to wake the believers up that he was writing to and say, contend for the faith. How do we do that? We know it, we believe it, and we live it out. We share it with other people. Last week, I know you studied about the Apostle Creed, the first five statements with Pastor Derek. And he shared some of those. Today, we're going to look at the rest of the Apostle Creed. Seven statements, but they can be found in these four points if you'll want to follow there with your worship guides. The first one is that we believe Jesus ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Now, if you look to the book of Luke a minute and the very last chapter... Uh, of Luke's gospel, we can see a, a picture of the ascension. And um, it's a very good picture of the ascension. Acts, Luke and Acts does a little bit more with it. Uh, Mark also writes about the ascension, but Mark is very, uh, he, he, when he writes, he writes about action. He just kind of writes what Jesus did or said and, and moves on to the next thing. He's very quick. Luke's a little bit more detail, especially here in the book of Acts. But it says in verse 50 of chapter 24 of Luke, it says, And he led them out 
as far as Bethany to the Mount of Olive area there. And he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. Now it came to pass that while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and he was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. So there's a, a beautiful picture of it. And if you've seen movies, I know there's a movie recently came out called Risen. And in that particular movie at the end, the Roman soldier who converts to the faith comes with the disciples and watches Jesus just go up into that cloud. What a beautiful scene that must have been. So there's a picture of it. And in that picture, Luke tells us some things that are happening. One, there's the actions by Jesus. He is blessing them. Even in his last words, giving them the authority to go out and to tell the world about him and blessing them, telling them how special they were and that God was going to be with them as they do this ministry, this work. He blessed them. And then the action by God the Father of receiving him up into heaven pulling him up into heaven by this miraculous power. And then of the disciples worship, that they worshiped him. Over in Acts, it says that they were puzzled, and we'll get to that in a minute with another part of this creed, but it says that they worshiped him. They looked forward to, in this event, to seeing him go up and to be a part with his father. But there's not only the picture of the ascension, but there's a purpose of it. It was, he was to be glorified with his father. John 17, Jesus prays what's often called the high priestly prayer. And verse 5, he prays this. He says, now, Father, glorify me together with you. With the glory, Lord, that I had with you before the world began. In other words, Jesus right there tells us, I was with the father in the beginning. John tells us that in John 1, the word was God and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Jesus reminds us why he had to go up, why he had to ascend, because he had to be glorified with God once again. Never again would he be here on the earth to live and to die. That wouldn't happen again. He would ascend to the Father to be glorified with him. He would also, in this purpose, sit at the right hand of the Father as well. Colossians 3.1 tells us that we're to Put our mind on things above where Christ is seated, it says, at the right hand of God the Father. To be at the right hand was to be at a place of honor. You might remember James and John and their mother came wanting them to be seated on Jesus' right hand or left hand when he came into the kingdom. The, the highest possible positions of honor. I want my boys to be there. And they argued and wanted to be there. Made the rest of the disciples upset when they found out about it. You know, what gives you that special place? But here, the Bible tells us that Jesus went to sit at the right hand of God. It's also a place where counsel is given and plans are carried out. And we're familiar with that term in our day. You've heard uh, someone say, they're my right hand man. What does that mean? It means they, they depend on them. They're dependable. They'll carry out something. They'll get it done. They're lock and step with you, walking and doing exactly what you want to do. There can be highly trusted. Jesus is sitting at God's right hand. Also, another purpose there is he intercedes for the saints. Look at Hebrews a minute, chapter 7 in the book of Hebrews. And in verses 25 through 28, we read these words of the writer to the book, to the Hebrews. It says, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy and is harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. There's that point of ascension. Who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son 
who has been perfected forever. In other words, Jesus continues to intercede for us. Now, we know he did that on earth because he told Peter, Peter, Satan is going to try to sift you. He wants to tempt you. He wants to bring you down. And Jesus knew he would be brought down, but he told him, I prayed for you. And when you are strengthened, when you come back, you strengthen your brothers. You're going to be a leader among them. So Jesus prayed for them. You know what Jesus is doing now for us? He is praying for the believers, for you and for me that know him. He is praying when we are struggling through things in our life, when we are being tempted. He is doing the work he continues to do. He didn't just go to heaven and take a break. He didn't do that. Sometimes people wonder, well, what's Jesus done since he went back to heaven? Well, he's praying. He's interceding. Every time Satan, and we're going to see this when we start looking at Job, accuses us as believers, it is Jesus who steps up and says, wait a minute. He knows me. She knows me. My blood has covered their sin. And he steps in and he fights for us. And he reminds the devil of our salvation. He intercedes for us. Hebrews 4 says that he's not like any other high priest because he can sympathize with us because he lived here and he went through temptations. He went through hard times just like we do, but yet without sin, Hebrews says. So we believe that he ascended and that he went to the right hand of the Father. Number two, we believe Jesus will come again and will judge the living and the dead. Look back to the book of Acts, to Luke's other account in Acts chapter 1 uh, of, um, of the ascension. In verse 9 it says, And now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Again, that cloud is a reminder of God's glory. It appears several times Throughout Scripture in the Old Testament, when God is present and shows up, it also appeared at the Transfiguration when Peter, James, and John looked upon Jesus uh, in the final uh, moments of that Transfiguration. They were enveloped in the cloud. So they're sort of familiar with a cloud and what happens in that, in that special time. But then look in verse 10. While they looked steadily fast toward heaven as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now, Jesus talked about his coming again. And the main thing he said about that coming again was that, no one knows the time or the hour. He said, not even the angels know. Only the Father knows the time, Matthew 24, 36. Paul said the church should remember his coming when we take the Lord's Supper. We don't think about that a lot when we take the Lord's Supper because we focus on what he did here on the earth, the death and, and his burial and his resurrection. But at the end of that, Paul in his statement said, we're to do this and remember this until he comes. There's a fact that Jesus not only came once, but he will came, come again. In the early church, they constantly were eagerly and looked for him. Paul wrote, the, Paul wrote the Thessalonians, and he reminded them of that. He said, I am so encouraged by your faith that you've turned from idols and also that you look eagerly to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the first century, they, they anticipated that with so much fervor. We don't anymore. We should, and we should get back to that because that's one of the principles, looking for Christ to come again. And then John in the Revelation says that when he comes again, every eye will see him with an emphasis on even those who pierced him. And we know there were some that especially did that, but all of us did that. All of our sin pierced Jesus. All of our sin put him on the cross for our sins as well. And he will come as a judge, Acts 17, 30. 
uh, through 31, Paul is preaching to the men at, at Athens and those that had so many different gods, and he had to tell them about their unknown God, that that was really the real God, the creator, and about Jesus, the Savior. And in verse 30, it says, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now, now he commands all men everywhere to repent, to turn from their sins, to turn to God, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Who will be the judge? Be Jesus. He earned that right by dying for our sins on the cross. And the Bible said we know he will be the judge because he was raised from the dead. No one else has that qualification to be judge. And also, he is God. And like Abraham said, When Abraham was conversing with God about Sodom and Gomorrah, he kept going back to that phrase, uh, won't all the the judge of all the earth, the righteous judge, do what is right? And the answer to that is, yes, he will. You see, he, he, he cannot be bought. He cannot be influenced. He doesn't have his prejudices with certain people. He is equal and he is fair and his judgment, and he will be when that time comes. It's a sharp contrast with the first coming. The first coming, he was meek and mild and suffering. This time, he will come in judgment and with wrath. Each, the Bible says, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11, each will give an individual account. We'll have our our life before us, and each of us will give that account of our life, of the words and deeds and things we did. And there'll be a a great division, Matthew says in chapter 25, between what Jesus says here, uh, between the sheep and the goats. The sheep will enter on the right, excuse me, on the right hand. The goats will enter on the left hand. And all those will will be told why, because they haven't put their trust in Christ and they haven't uh, looked out for him in their life. And uh, it didn't show up in their ministry and what they did. You remember that parable? It's interesting because those people that uh, didn't do the things that they needed to do for Christ, they said, well, when did we see you like this? When did we see you sick or naked or hurt or afraid or whatever? And Jesus told them the very answer. He said, when you saw the least of these, then that's when you should have reached out. They were me looking for help, looking for you to be like Christ, be like God to them. You're probably familiar with that commercial that's been on TV lately. I think it's Progressive Insurance that does it. A couple arguing over something, trying to blame each other, who left this, who didn't leave this, and all of a sudden, one of them throws down a red flag like a referee. And all of a sudden, a little referee comes out from the, to represent the insurance company or whatever, and he, he pulls out the instant replay. And there's all of a sudden footage of exactly what happens. And of course, usually the wife wins in the commercial and goes, see, I told you this is what you said. And she was right, of course. Well, in that day, there will be a replay and there'll be the God, the judge who gets it all right. We might claim we did this or said we did this, but he knows exactly what we did. And that should bring about an awe and a sense of reverence between us and our Lord for sure. Three, we believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church and the communion of the saints. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. It's interesting, this whole creed is Trinitarian in that it talks of the Father, it talks of the Son, and now it talks of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit um, was alluded to even in the Ascension before Uh, that passage in Acts 1 where Christ is taken up, Jesus has just talked to them and he said, you're going to be my witnesses. And how are they to do it? They're to wait until what? The Holy Spirit comes upon them and the Holy Spirit will live in them and make it possible for them to share the gospel and will make miracles happen and will do great work in them. Matter of fact, Christ in a very intimate conversation telling his disciples that he had to die and suffer and go to the cross, 
He says, it's to your advantage that I leave. Now, I would be like the disciples. What do you mean it's to our advantage? We've got you right here, flesh and blood, God, son of God, watching you do miracles, having you love on us, having you encourage us. What's it, how, how is it going to be an advantage if you go away? But yet he tells them, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity will come and he will indwell every believer everywhere at the same time. Jesus couldn't do that. Jesus was flesh and blood. He was limited by space and, and time where he was. But the Holy Spirit could go throughout each believer and bring them together and united. He could pull off things like Pentecost where all of a sudden all of them were speaking in tongues. All of them were singing and praising God. I wasn't here last week. I wish I was. I was told though very quickly about uh, the extended service, the invitation, basically was like another service almost. And there's no explanation. I've been in those just a few times in my life, but there's no explanation for that. You can't point to the preaching or a certain song or anything like that. You simply have to say, it's the Holy Spirit's work. And the Holy Spirit comes across and does things that are amazing. I remember one time I was telling uh, some people about this today, uh, I've seen a few occasions of that. One was at Shaco. Right after we had come here, I took uh, one of our kids' groups to Shaco to camp. And I remember one of the nights, I think it was the, or the end of the, the week, uh, we had our last worship service. And uh, Jeff Slaughter was there who used to do the VBS music. And I remember him, him leading in a song and all of a sudden he just felt the need to keep going. And Nobody complained. Everybody continued to sing. And then he changed into another song and another song. And it seemed like it went on forever, but it didn't seem like it went on forever. And all of a sudden, some of these kids, now fourth, fifth, sixth grade, went to the altar and started praying. It's amazing. Kids in our group began crying and began talking to each other and saying they were sorry for things that they had said to each other that week. It was, it was a revival truly among kids. I knew it was revival because Gracie even went and hugged Noah. That was real revival <laughs> at that point because normally they stayed away from each other, you know, called each other names and stuff. And, of course, on the way home, things were pretty much back to normal. But afterward, I remember us going out and talking about that, and all the kids were saying, I don't know why I was crying. I just felt like I needed to, and I felt really close to God, and, you know, all that that carried on and went on. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He does things when he pulls us together and he does things that is unimaginable that we can do. And we see that throughout the early church. John 14 and John 16 tell us his job descriptions. He comforts, he teaches, he empowers, he convicts. And then he says, we also believe in one holy church. The word holy means separated unto God for a special purpose. We are, as Paul says, the bride who awaits the groom who is Christ. And we look forward to him coming and being a part. But until then, we join together to do what he's called us to do. To evangelize the world, to worship him, to minister to each other. All those phrases in the New Testament that say one another. We're to be about that business. Forgiving one another, loving one another, encouraging one another, exhorting one another. All those different things that we're to do to each other. And some of you have experienced that in this church. And I hope, if you haven't, I hope you will. Some, for some of you, people in this church are closer to you than your own family are. And that's because it's God's Spirit. His Spirit is in you. His Spirit is in the people within this church, the brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what the church is about. Now, for Baptists... There's always a woe at this point in the creed. I remember reading this for the first time, maybe in a Methodist church or somewhere I was visiting, and I remember I stopped because some versions have the Catholic church. And I went, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm not Catholic. And yet, as a little quote I put in there from Matt Chandler kind of explains that, it is a little C, not a big C. And it's translated from the Greek word, Catholicos, which means according to the whole or universal. In other words, it's basically saying that this is the Catholic church, is the church that is all Christians everywhere 
included in the communion of saints and also for all time as well. And so he writes there and tells you kind of his interpretation of it in um, Apostles Together, Together We, or Apostles Creed, Together We Believe. The saints. In the Roman Catholic denomination, the word saint is awarded only to those who are, we would say, super Christians. We think of the Mother Teresa's and others of the world that did great work. But yet, the New Testament, Paul calls every believer a saint. If you'll read in those letters, he'll say, to the saints at such and such church. And believe me, many of them were not super Christians. They were just like you and me. They had a tough time getting it together. They had a tough time walking with Christ. They weren't out doing great ministry and missions for the Lord yet. But they were saints because they were set apart to do that, set apart to be special in God's eyes. And we know uh, 1 Peter, Peter writes and says that we're a, a, a chosen uh, nation, a royal priesthood elected to follow God and to be his example, his representatives here on earth. Number four, finally it says, we believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting, amen. Forgiveness of sins, that's really the, the crux of the matter, isn't it? It's really why Christ came. It's really the, the whole plan of salvation. It's the, really the whole story of the Bible is to take away our sins. You see, there was a holy God, and then there was man who was rebellious. Do you know that when you read the Bible, there are only four chapters in the Bible that actually have no sin in them. <laughs> Genesis 1 and 2, I often say, uh, I read somewhere where someone said this, I always, I always repeat it, hang on it. We're not living in a Genesis 2 world, we're living in a Genesis 3 world where sin came in and ever since then, throughout all the Old Testament, throughout all the New Testament, throughout all history, until you get to Revelation 21, where finally the new heaven and the new earth comes and there is no sin to be found. So our problem is sin. Our problem is, as humans, we want to rebel. Just like Adam, that sin is passed on, Paul says in Romans 5.12, through Adam it, it came to each one of us and each one of us sin and each one of us die. James says that when we sin, it leads to, to death and to destruction. It leads to separation from God. But the good news is that because of what Christ did, because what we've already said in the creed, that he suffered, he died, and he gave his life for us, there can be forgiveness of sins. And we have the high priest, as we said, that sympathizes with us, but yet he hasn't sinned, but yet he steps in and he is for us, and he is our advocate, John says, when we do sin, even now, as believers. John says, we have an advocate. We have someone that will stand in our place and go for us in that way. Forgiveness is made possible through Christ's death on the cross. Today, maybe you have never came to know Christ. You've never trusted that. You've never thought about your sin. You've never thought about how you have gone your way rather than God's way. Today's the day you may need to repent, which means to turn from the direction you're going and turn toward God. It means giving your life to him, trusting that Jesus' blood will cover your sin, and then looking forward to being with him in a relationship where you'll grow and grow and learn more about him and one day be with him in heaven. The Bible also says there that we believe in the forgiveness of, or the creed, forgiveness of sin, and also the resurrection of the body. Randy Alcorn has probably one of the best books on heaven. If you ever want to read one, it's about that thick. And he deals with about every possibility, possible question you might have about heaven to the best of his ability. And in that book, he writes this. He says, um, of Americans who believe in the resurrection from the dead, two-thirds believe they will not have bodies after the resurrection. But this, he says, is self-contradictory. A non-physical resurrection is like a sunless sunrise. <laughs> he says, there is no such thing. Resurrection means we will have bodies. If we didn't have bodies, we would not be resurrected. So true. 
We don't just float around as spirits, but yet we have bodies, the Bible teaches, and we'll have resurrection body to live in a new heaven and a new earth. If it's an earth like this one, but so much better, we'll need a body to function in it and to do the things we need to do that God asks us to do. So we believe in the resurrected body. Again, it was a stab in Jude's mind back at those Gnostics that said, Jesus wasn't really in the flesh and he didn't really die for us and he didn't really raise again being in a resurrected body. Jude would say, oh yes, he did. Because the apostles saw him and the apostles can testify of that witness. And you can go to 1 Thessalonians 4.13 that talks about that hope we have in the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15.50, Paul talks there about the body that will be raised, what? Incorruptible. It was corruptible, but now it's going to be raised incorruptible. It was mortal. It would end, but now it will be raised immortal. It'll last forever. We believe in the resurrection of the body. What a wonderful, wonderful thing to look forward to especially when your bodies here on this earth begin to wear out and maybe they've been tough to deal with all your life. What a wonderful thing to look forward to. And then he says, not only the resurrection of the body, but the last statement of belief, he says, in the life everlasting. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John three sixteen that God would give those who believe in him, what? Eternal life, life to go on forever. In John 10, 10, he said, I have come to give them life and that life more abundantly or eternally. Broad life, continuing life, forever life. Jesus wanted his disciples. He talked to them over and over about that. He wanted anyone he encountered to believe in him so they would live with him forever. That's God's love. That's his goal. If people would just know that, if they would think God is not out to get them, but God has a plan to bring them to him, to live with him forever and ever. In the last battle, which is a, a book in the Chronicles of Narnia series, there is a, the, the last book is actually called The Last Battle. And uh, as I tell people, it's kind of, I don't know if this is a good way to say it, but maybe Revelation for Dummies. <laughs> if you can, uh, or maybe Revelation Light. It has the truth of Revelation uh, but yet uh, kind of put in a fictional story so you can kind of understand it better. Uh, much easier for people like me uh, to, to take that than maybe to understand some harder, harder courses on it. But anyway, if you read that book, everything is coming to the end in Narnia. If you're even familiar with that at all, that whole world is coming to an end. And Aslan the lion who sang it into creation in the first book now speaks it and brings it to an end. And once it's at the end, the door opens, the door closes, and they're in a whole new place where everything looks like Narnia, but it's much better than Narnia. Every flower is very vivid and bright. Everything they see seems to be up close. They can run in this country without being tired. They can even think no fear. They even swim up a, a waterfall, and they said that when they got the top, surely they would be afraid, but he they said they could not even think of fear. Fear wouldn't even come into their mind. And they saw old friends who they thought were dead and gone, but now were at the peak of their, their life. One of the characters of the talking animals is Jewel the Unicorn. She says this, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I have been looking for all my life. Though I never knew it until now. The reason why we love the old Narnia is that it sometimes looked a little like this. Come further up, come further in. And then C.S. Lewis finishes the book of his chronicles with these words. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last they were, the, they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, and which every chapter is better than the one before. That's a good summary of heaven. Matter of fact, Paul kind of put it that way in 1 Corinthians 2.9. He says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has planned for those who love him. 
It's amazing what we'll see and what we'll enjoy. Well, the Apostles' Creed, it is a, an oath per se. It's a pledge to say that we believe this and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna stand by this. And, and as a family, we need those. Your, your, your family has certain oaths, certain things they believe in, maybe honesty or uh, helping each other or whatever. We need something as a family of God. And the Apostles' Creed is kind of that. It is not scripture, as Derek told you last week, but yet it brings about the principles from scripture. And we lean on that and we look to that. On December 5th, 2018, there was a rare event at our nation's capital city in Washington, D.C. It was an event in which uh, President, former President George H.W. Bush was funeralized. Great funeral at the National Cathedral. And in that event, there were five presidents, former or living presidents there. Of course, George W. Bush was there for his dad and sat with his family, but on the other pew uh, in the National Cathedral, there sat the other former presidents. There was Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. There was also um, Bill and Hillary Clinton. And there was also Barack and Michelle Obama. And then finally, there was Donald Trump and Melania. And they went through all the things you do in the funeral. You sing and you listen to the speakers. And there's one thing they did also is that they read the Apostles' Creed. Now, as they were reading the creed, of course, everybody pays attention and press looks for anything they can do to scrutinize presidents. And the question that came out afterwards was, all the other presidents but Trump seemed to read the creed and be involved in it. But Trump didn't. He just simply held it and, and closed his, his arms together and looked straight ahead. And those, of course, against him said, well, is he even a Christian? Christians know they should say this. Those that were for him said, well, you know, it's easy to get distracted in church. It's easy to, to be, have your mind on something else, especially when you're president. Well, I'll tell you today, I, I can't tell you what he believes or what the other presidents believe, but I can tell you what I know we should do with the creed. We should read it. We should know it. We should believe it. We should live it out. And we should also share it with other people. I want to encourage you to do that. Because when you're sharing that, you're sharing God's word. You're challenging them to know the real Lord and to ask him into your life and to live for him. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer and then we'll have our time of invitation. If you have a decision to make, maybe you've never trusted Christ. As I said earlier, today's the day to come down and do that. Maybe you need to come and rededicate your life or join this church and be a part. We can tell you how to do that as well. Or maybe like last Sunday, you just need to come to the altar and pray about something or ask me to pray for you or have one of our deacons that'll be up front to pray for you. Uh, you do as God leads you to do at this time. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you teach us, God, through your scriptures about the relationship we need with you and all the, the wonderful things as Apostle Creed brings out that you've done for us. Thank you for being a creator God. Thank you for being a God that sent Jesus for us on the cross to die for our sins. Thank you that you raised him and he ascended to heaven. And right now we can take great assurance that he is praying for us and lifting us up before the Father. And Lord, we look forward to one day when we will be resurrected and we will live with him forever and ever. What a wonderful thought, God. What a wonderful love you have for us. Let us proclaim that back to you through song and through what we say and through how we live, God. We just ask these things in your name. We pray today, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. Stand with us. As God leads, you respond this morning.
Thank you for joining us online today. We're so glad you could worship with us virtually this morning. Before you go, we want to remind you about two important ways to connect with us at FBTC. First, if you're new, have a prayer request, or made a decision of any kind, please make sure and fill out one of our online connect cards. Our pastors pray over every card and will connect with you during the week if you made a decision. Second, if you're already a part of our faith family, we want to remind you that online giving is available on our website. Giving through this platform is both safe and easy, so we'd love if you gave it a try. Again, thanks for being with us today, and we'll see you next Sunday.